because you didn't get it. So over the past two weeks, uh, Pastor Chuck's been talking. Uh, we, we, he started this series, and then he asked me to speak because uh, he's actually in Los Angeles or almost. Um, so the series is Bright Lights on Dark Nights. And uh, <laughs> real quick, Pastor Chuck, you don't want to talk about spiritual attacks. So yesterday he was... Uh, he had to do a wedding. I almost said funeral. <laughs> he had to do a wedding, and then he was on a time crunch, and so he had to leave the wedding immediately and drive to Charlottesville to get on a plane to fly from Charlottesville to Chicago to L.A. to be in L.A. last night to speak at the, at the Los Angeles Dream Center this morning at Angeles Temple. So <laughs> I'm talking to him on his way to Charlottesville, and he's like, you know, I got an hour, so I mean, it's, I'm literally going to have to go in, go right through, and get right on the plane. I said, that's cool. So uh, next thing you know, I get a, he, I get a text. He says, Flight canceled. And I'm like, oh no. Because you know, if you're in Charlottesville and your flight gets canceled, there's no, let's just pick up the next plane because that was it. That was the one. Um, so he literally took a cab ride to DC from Charlottesville last night, got on a plane in DC, flying to Chicago and flying to LA. He's not going to land in LA until 10 o'clock in the morning. He's going to miss the first service, have to go straight from the airport to um, Angelus Temple and preach, not even get a chance to iron his clothes or anything, which he was actually more upset about not being able to iron his clothes than he was about missing the first service. Um, so anyways, be praying for him because uh, I thought I was uh, under the gun with this morning, and he's like really, uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure, but you know what? God comes through, and it's, uh, it all works out. So crazy story. So we've been talking about um, bright lights on dark nights, and you know, the Halloween season provides this backdrop for the series um, you'll see many homes uh, embrace this season of darkness, um, but I'm not here to preach against trick-or-treating or, or uh, jack-o'-lanterns or scarecrows or anything like that. Um, in, in fact, I've always enjoyed pranking people and scaring people. I've always gotten a thrill out of seeing the fear in other people. I um, used to prank people all the time. Um, in fact, we had a Christmas party at church, and we all exchanged a $5 gift, and so my gift, I went to the pet store, and I bought like three feeder mice, and I put them in a box, and wrapped it, and brought it to the Christmas party, and lovely Dawn Valentine got that gift, and she opens it up, and out runs these mice, she throws it, she screams, mice are going everywhere, it was a moment of sheer fear and panic, and I loved it. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I'm not like preaching against those kind of things. Um, <laughs> we're talking about, about spiritual darkness. Um, the past couple days, you want to talk about realizing that the things in your life are a spiritual attack. Uh, this week, this past couple days have been like the biggest, I mean, little attacks nonstop. And there's no coincidence to it because I knew I was going to be preaching Sunday and the devil's like, if I can do anything I can to mess him up, I'm going to do it. And so like, you know, Thursday, I kind of have a moment with uh, one of the, the bosses at work, and it was like, I mean, it was one of those moments, and in my head, I was like, I'm about to lose my job, like, because I'm about to go off on this guy, but anyways, I didn't, um, and so it was a really rough day, so then, you know, I'm leaving, my wife texts me, she says, hey, the throttle cable on the push mower broke, okay, all right, I'll fix that, don't worry, and uh, get home, and she has to leave, and then she's like, the car won't start, okay, all right. Let's figure that out. I called a friend, uh, brought his jump box over, found out it's a battery. So I run down, buy a battery. She goes, she's off, she's on her way. Everything's good, I'm cool. And then yesterday, I'm at work and I come out to my car and I'm pulling out of the parking garage. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I have a flat tire. I'm like, what are the odds of all of these things happening in a 24 hour period? Uh, pretty good, actually, when you're trying to do things in God's will and Satan's like, hey, I got to do everything I can to trip them up. But uh, there was a moment of real darkness and fear in my life uh, yesterday morning. So I'm walking into work. It's just before 6 o'clock. I'd be there at 6, and it's dark out. And I'm walking up this walkway, and on my right side, there's this, uh, this wall of pavers, and on the left side, there's a hedge. I'm the only one there. It's very dark. And I'm walking, and all of a sudden, I see something right here. And, you know, I was like, oh, stupid cat. I look, and it's a skunk. <laughs> you want to talk about sheer fear. I'm telling you, I did my best Heisman pose, screamed like a girl, and ran down the walkway. And, you know, you might want to, you, you may like think, oh, you know, whatever, big sissy. But I guarantee you, if you were alone in darkness and there's a skunk less than a foot away from your feet, 
you're running. I mean, you're not, you're not like uh, just going to hang out. So that was a moment of sheer fear. But we're not talking about that kind of fear. We're talking about true spiritual darkness. Um, and the darkness we're addressing is far more sinister than jack-o'-lanterns, scary costumes, and skunks. You may think that I'm crazy, but I do believe that there is a spiritual dimension and parallel universe that we are living in. Um, much like the show, Stranger Things. Has anybody seen Stranger Things on Netflix? Amazing. Can't wait for second season. Coming out in a couple weeks. Uh, so anyways, great show. But there is a, a, another dimension and, uh, that these creatures are living in, and they end up coming through and attacking. And it's really crazy stuff because there's a lot of spiritual implications there when you think about our world around us. Um, Ephesians 6.12 says... For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. See, evil spirits are wreaking havoc throughout the earth. See, we're not talking about the jack-o'-lanterns and all that kind of stuff. We're talking about the dark forces that are behind mass murders, terrorist attacks, Racial division, oppression, sickness, disease, broken homes, and broken lives. People are hurting all over this world, and it is all a result of a spiritual attack. So I believe, as a Christian, that I am called to invade that darkness and free its prisoners. How many of you believe that? We are not talking about contrasting colors when we're talking about light and darkness. We're not talking about green and red or white and black. There's a big difference between those colors and darkness and light. See, darkness, all it is, is the absence of light and nothing more. Darkness cannot override the light. Once the light is on, the darkness has to flee. It's not like two colors and you mix them together and they create something else. When the light is on, the darkness flees. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Jesus is the light of the world. And it's not a coincidence that God uses light and darkness as a representation of good and evil. See, the parallel between physical light and darkness and spiritual light and darkness is undeniable. They're not opposite colors. There's really big significance when you compare them spiritually and physically. See, a few years back, the BBC did an experiment. They took six volunteers, and they put them each into a room, and uh, like a hospital room, but it's kind of like a prison cell, small, and it had a bed, and it was, you know, air-conditioned or whatever. Um, but they volunteered to spend 48 hours in complete darkness, okay? Unbelievable, the effects. You have some people that weren't even three or four hours in, screaming, wanting to get out. No other, no other influences but the absence of light. What's even crazier is that halfway into the experiment, now this is just two days, just two days. You could probably do just about anything for two days. Halfway through the experiment, the majority of these people began to hallucinate. Vivid hallucinations, seeing things that were not there. And they believed wholeheartedly that they were seeing something in front of them. This is only one day into this experiment in darkness. In the 1960s, there was a study done where Antoine Senny, who was a spelunker and scientist, spent 126 days in a cave in complete isolation, 126 days by himself. He had packed up enough food, he packed up enough resources to be able to live, but he was living in this cave in isolation and darkness. See, without the sun, Antoine had become completely, he completely lost track of time. He would go to sleep for what he thought was an hour nap. He would wake up, and it was 30 hours later. When you are living in darkness, not only do you see things as a false light 
that aren't actually there, but your life flashes by. You get to the end of it and you realize, oh my gosh, where has my time gone? When you're living in darkness, you are constantly attacked. There is no peace, hope, or love found in darkness. None. It's all a false image and a false light. See, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But God says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. You see, it all started with the first sin. You know, talk about this darkness. This all started with the first sin. And I'm not talking about Adam and Eve. I'm talking about before this. You know, this is the kind of deep theological stuff. But you should research it yourself. This is my uh, synopsis or my uh, view of this. So before Adam and Eve, and the Bible talks about Lucifer, okay? Lucifer, the crown jewel of heaven, worship leader and anointed cherub, okay? Lucifer in Hebrew is translated as Halel and means shining one and morning star. Did everybody, did everybody know that? A few of you? Okay. It's crazy when you think about this. So Lucifer was the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. It is said that he was God's greatest creation to that point. So if Lucifer was such an important and beautiful creation, and his sole responsibility was to worship at the throne of God, then we have to be able to conclude that worship is very important action to God. Does everybody see that? So Lucifer created perfect in all of his ways, beautiful. He is this image of light, and his sole purpose was to worship at the throne of God then obviously God sees a huge importance for the action of worship. See, even though Lucifer was cast out of heaven, some people said he fell, but the Bible says he was cast down like a lightning bolt to the earth. And as Pastor Chuck said, he was flicked out of heaven like a booger and smeared on the earth. <laughs> Which I love that. I, I thought that was great. Because there's no struggle there. He says, boom, done, next. You know, so just because he was cast out of heaven, thrown out of heaven, doesn't mean that the action of worship isn't just as important today as it was then. So God created him to worship, perfect in beauty and full of light to worship God, cast him out of heaven, doesn't negate the fact that worship is important to God. If you are facing darkness the key to lighting it up is through your worship. If you want to light up the darkness in your life, you're going to have to learn to worship God in everything that you do. And I'm not just talking about the way you sing and the way you, you shout and you praise God. All those are great. We're talking about worshiping God in everything that you do. All of the actions of your life, you know, presenting to God in worship. So I believe that every person can ignite their soul with three acts of worship. Today is all about lighting it up. It's about lighting up the darkness in your life so that you can shine for the world to see, to be the city set upon a hill. You know, we don't light a light and hide it under a bushel, right? The old children's church song is still true today. It's to be shown to the world that's living in darkness. So that first act is the act of service. You see, the first sin was pride. See, Lucifer wanted to put himself above everyone. His desire to be served instead of serving others. See, Matthew says that no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and you will love the other. You will be devoted to one and you will despise the other. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then in Luke 6, 27 through 28, But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, 
Bless those who curse you and pray for those who hurt you. And that is so contrary to what the world speaks. If you want to stay in darkness, harbor bitterness. You know, support division and oppression. If you want to keep darkness in your life. But if you want to ignite your soul and light up the darkness of division, then love others and serve them. That is as simple as it gets. Regardless of their color, financial status, religion, political views, even if they hate you, love them anyways. That is so easy to say, and it is so hard to do. And I tell you what, that was presented to me this week, that situation of work. I'm telling you what, I'm like, man, if I wasn't saved, this guy, I would, you know, I'd be, I would have lost my job, period. Because, you know, when people are disrespectful to you, talk down to you, or demeaning to you, what's our first reaction? Is to get offended and swell up. I'm just saying, and that was my, uh, that was in my, in my mind. I was thinking of everything. I was like, I take this pencil and writing it. No, I mean, it, it wasn't quite that, that far, but I was literally thinking, this guy, I bet if I slapped him, he would cry. You know what I mean? So, and so uh, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you know, you don't want this. You don't know who you're talking to. But, in, you know, I had to say, you know what? Yes, sir. Mm, I hate it, but all right. You're right. You know, because what, what does Jesus want you to do? You know, I mean, it says it here, love those serve others. I mean, that's what it's all about. So we look at our world, and it's like, you cannot stop this division in our world without the love of God. The stuff that happened in Charlottesville, the stuff that happened in Las Vegas, these are all acts of the devil himself trying to cause division, trying to break people apart, and it's rampant throughout the world. Do we not see it? In every area of life, Satan causing division in homes, in churches, in governments, countries worldwide, people hating each other for the simplest reasons. I mean, what would it be like if we were just to, just to say, you know what, forget it, and love the people that hate us? Have you ever tried loving somebody that hates you? Man, it, it you know, kill them with kindness. Selena Gomez, kill them. Kill them with kindness. Um, so, you want to light up your soul, you've got to learn to serve. That's it. I mean, it's, it's very important, and it's very hard, and it's, uh, it's not easy, but it's worth it. The second action is the act of speech. I think I've missed some stuff. I hate this. Yes, I will. You know what? We're going to go back. I, you're probably in the back like freaking out, like, what is he doing? So when we printed this out, it printed it out both sides. And so if you have nine pages, you know how hard that is? Like, wait, where, what, what page was I on? Okay, so we're going back. We're just going back. Yeah, it's okay. You guys are doing a great job. Okay, so we already know what the first action is, but I'm going to st still go back to this whole, this whole theory of darkness because I was looking at my notes. I'm like, man. We're going to get out of here in like 10 minutes. They're not going to be open for lunch. Uh, so anyways, uh, so we're going back to this study that, you know, when, the, when these, this spelunker and scientist was down in the ground, you know, when he came up, when he came up from the ground, he thought that the date was, okay, he thought that the date was February 4th, and in reality, it was April 5th, April 5th. So he had no watch or clock or anything like that. He lost track of time living in darkness. He had lost 60 days that passed by, and he didn't even know it. And that's so true. If you're, if you're living you know, in, a, in, a, in a life full of darkness, your life flies by. I have lived a life that was trapped in darkness. I knew what was right and wrong, but I let the temptation of sin draw me into a dark place. This reminds me of one of my favorite movies of all time. The Lion King. Look, Simba. Just watch. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. Wow. Everything the light touches. What a 
about that shadowy place? That's beyond our borders. You must never go there, Simba. But I thought a king can do whatever he wants. Oh, there's more to being king than getting your way all the time. There's more? <laughs> you made it. Wow. It's really creepy, yeah. Isn't it great? We could get in big trouble. I know. <laughs> I wonder if its brains are still in there. There's only one way to know. Come on, let's go check it out. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. <laughs> that was it? <laughs> Do it again. If you ever come near my son again. Man, isn't that so true of life? Here I am, I'm Zazu. I'm like, no, you're not. You're not going there. Don't go there. I'm telling you, don't do it. But some of you are going to walk out of here and you're just going to say, you know what? Let's go anyways. It looks cool. It looks fun. How exciting is this? That's what sin does. Sin uses that evil woman, Nala. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. She's not an evil kitty. <laughs> and she convinces him. To, you know what? Let's just go. Let's just go do this. How cool would it be? And next thing you know, and he's a king's kid. As a king's kid, right, you feel like you can do whatever you want. God's given you the tools. He's given you the keys. And he's also said, you know what? You have a free choice and a will to do whatever you want with your life. And we say, okay, cool. We go and do it. Till next thing you know, we're in a position that we're backed against the wall and our whole life is in front of us and we feel like we're about to lose everything and die and guess what happens? We call out to God and he comes in every single time. Every single time, any obstacle you're facing, when you call out to him, he comes in and he says, listen, if you ever lay hands on my son again, I'm telling you, that's the will of the Father, the love of the Father. It supersedes any kind of love you could ever have in your life. There's no love or attraction you can have to another person that is like the love of the Father. See, the love of the Father goes even beyond this. I was talking to a good friend about this. God's love, I cannot wrap my head around it. See, I would give my life, for some of you, I would give my life for my friends. I would give my life for my family. I would gladly step in front of a gun for my wife, my kids, my family, and my friends. I'll tell you one thing I wouldn't do. I wouldn't give up my son for anyone. No one. There's not a person in this world that I would give up my family for. And the love of the Father, he says, you know what? I would give my son, my only son. It's not just to love you enough that I would give my life, but I'd give my kids. I cannot fathom that kind of love. I can't imagine that love. And then on top of that, to do it for somebody that would spit in your face. To do it for somebody that would say that they hate you. And say, you know what? I love you no matter what. I would give my child for you. I can't imagine. I cannot wrap my head around that kind of love. You see, Satan is masquerading as the angel of light, presenting this false love to humanity, this false hope. You're living in darkness. You see these images that you feel like are light, and you believe them wholeheartedly, but they're a hallucination. It's Satan. I was praying. I was preparing for this sermon, and God put something in my head, and I'm just going to talk about it, but because uh, there's no other way I would have ever thought about this. Immediately, the Pied Piper... I can't, this stinking thing is driving me nuts. I feel like I'm walking around with a stiff neck. <laughs> so the story of the Pied Piper popped into my head, okay? Randomly. Why would I ever think about this? It had to have been God. So I started looking it up. Does everybody know the story of the Pied Piper? Okay, some of you. I'm going to explain it. Okay, this took place 
This is a children's story that we share today about, you know, he's the piper, and he, you see him leading the rats out of the city. There was a part in Shrek, he was in Shrek, and then Disney did an old cartoon about him years and years ago. So you have the Pied Piper that comes to the city of Hamelin in Germany, and in this city was infested with rats, okay? And the Pied Piper says, well, I can deliver you from these rats. I can take all these rats out of here, and the king, uh, or the, the leader agrees to pay him a certain sum of money, and he comes and he plays his little flute in his, dry, in his uh, bright clothes and he leads all the rats out of the city. They follow him and they all jump into the river and drown, okay? Now, there are parts of this story, there are multiple stories that have passed down through generations and generations because this happened in 1284. The story has changed some over that time, but there's one thing that remains true to this story, and it's not the rats, See, the Pied Piper, after delivering the city from the rats, he comes back, and the city doesn't pay him. They pay him a portion of what they had said they were going to pay him. And at that point, the Pied Piper leads 130 children from this city. While people were in church, leads 130 people out of the city and into a cave where they were never seen again. Never taught me that one in the nursery rhyme. Never taught me that one in the kids. They didn't tell me that one before I went to bed. I know that because I would have not went to sleep. Um, so the one thing that remains true to this story of all the different accounts of this are not the rats. It's the fact that the Pied Piper came to the city and 130 kids went missing. The oldest recorded documentation of this said in the year 1284 on the day of St. John and Paul, on June 26, by a piper clothed in many kinds of colors, 130 children born in Hamelin were seduced and lost at the place of execution. What? I read that and I was like, wow, I never knew that. I was never taught that. I just thought he delivered the rats. And then the Disney portrayal, it's kind of funny because you go back and you watch the old cartoon and he comes in, he delivers the rats, they don't give him the money. And so they depict it as these kids were like child workers, and he delivered them into this mountain and opened up this cave, and inside of there was just candy and playgrounds. They're all happy, and then the cave closes behind them. Isn't that what Satan does? Comes into your life dressed in bright clothes, lures you away from safety, and until next thing you know, hi, how's it going? Until next thing you know, your whole life is gone. And you're trapped in a cave of darkness. But I tell you what, God can find that cave. He can deliver you from wherever you are. But you have to start to recognize the true enemy. It is Satan masquerading as the angel of light. See, he lost that light when he was cast down. There is no light in him. Satan who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. I mean, that's in the Bible. That's what he does. He's put these blinders over kids, over adults, leading them into, away into this make-believe place, this hallucination of happiness. And next thing you know, their whole life is gone. But Jesus, he is the light of the world. I'm not going to re-talk re about all that stuff, but I'm back on track. So, you know, the first act is service. We talked about this. This action of worship to light up your life. This morning, it's all about getting lit. It, nobody got that. Okay. <laughs> Urban Dictionary. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Somebody got it. Um, look at your neighbor. Tell, this morning, we getting lit. <laughs> I'm <laughs> just kidding. And people walked out. No, 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 because that's it. It's all about lighting up your soul. It's about igniting the fire inside your life. That first act is service. I think I'm back. I think I'm back. I never will do this again. Okay, so the second one, second action is the act of speech. Okay, the act of speech. Now, speech is defined as the ability to express thoughts and feelings by articulate sounds. So it's more than just the words you say. 
It's about how you praise God vocally. You want to light up your soul? You're going to have to start thanking him. You're going to start talking to him. Start praying. You know, start speaking positively. Words, uh, Yehuda Berg, I don't know who this is, but it's a good quote. So it says that words are singular, singularly the most powerful force available to humanity. We can choose to use this force constructively with words of encouragement or destructively using words of despair. Words have energy and power with the ability to help, to heal, to hinder, to hurt, to harm, humiliate, and humble. Your words are powerful. Does everybody agree? The things that you speak over your life have power in them. The things that you speak over your kids have power in them. And sometimes it's the words that aren't said. I mean, some of you may have grown up with a dad that never told you he loved you. What it would be like to be able to go back and your father look at you and say, you know what, I love you and I'm proud of you. I try every single day to tell my kids how proud of, me, proud of them I am how much I love them, how I believe in them, and I think that they're world changers. And you know what? I do believe it, and I believe it's going to change their life. They will always remember that their dad encourages them. The way you talk to people changes the way that they act. The way you speak over your own life. You know, you might say, you look at your life, you say, it is what it is, but it doesn't have to be. You may say, well, you know what? I was born this way. I was born an alcoholic. I was born this way, but you don't have to die that way. See, we were born in this earth filled with darkness. Satan was cast down to the earth. This earth is a dark place. And if you're not careful, you will be deceived just like Adam and Eve they chose to walk in their own will. And that separated them from God. When we get to heaven, we're going to have a talk. Me and Eve and Adam. Because they messed it up. <laughs> so, the act of speech. Some of you need to start doing some positive affirmations. You need to look yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? You are good looking. You are smart. You are powerful. Today, you will win. What would it be like if you start, I mean, people think you're crazy. I used to do positive affirmations all the time in selling real estate. I would just get up, and today is the day, you know? And every, every call I make will be profitable. Every this, you know, all these kind of things. You know why? Because the way you speak, it shifts your mindset. And when your mindset shifts, your actions line up. If you walk into your office, you say, you know what? Today is going to suck. It's a Monday, had a rough weekend, had a terrible week. Today's going to be terrible. You know what? You're right. It's going to suck. <laughs> you know why? Because you started out that way, and you spoke about it. You spoke it into existence. I'm not the name it, claim it type. I mean, I'm claiming a Corvette. If one of you want to give me a Corvette, I'll take it, because I've always wanted one. But anyways, I'm claiming it. No, I'm not, I'm not pushing it that far. But I'm saying that I am claiming that my kids are healthy, that my family's protected, that I'm walking in his will, that God loves me, that he created me in his image. When you speak, let your words be uplifting. Let them be encouraging. And it will ignite your soul. I promise you, change your speech, change your life. It's simple. Serve others and change the way you speak. Proverbs 18, 20 through 22. A man's stomach will be filled with the fruit of his mouth. He will be filled with what his lips speak. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Your words can build and they can destroy. Your speech is powerful and your praise changes the atmosphere. Do you believe that your speech makes an impact? Do you believe that? The things that you say, your actions, 
The noise that comes out of your mouth changes things. If it doesn't, then why do we cheer at football games? Why? Why is it that at a NASCAR race, you'll see the guy in the corner saying, that way, the driver knows. He knows he needs to go that way. You know, like, I mean, he can't hear you. <laughs> it's so loud, you can't hear you, but you yell anyways. Why? Because you believe that your noise, your speech makes an impact. I am one rowdy fan. I'm telling you, it's gotten me in trouble before. I mean, Nathan, football games, you just, you just play Riverheads. I'm, the, I'm one of the loudest fans there. People hate me. Don't sit in front of me because I'm radical. And it used to get the best of me because I'd get ticked off. I'd want to fight a high school kid. You know? <laughs> Where's his dad? Show me his dad. And I'm like, okay, that's his dad. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's me. I'm so big and bad. You get on the field and you're like, man, these guys are big. <laughs> I'm not, you're, you feel way bigger sitting in the stands. You get on the field, you're like, man, these, what are they feeding these kids? You know? But I'm that radical fan. And I believe wholeheartedly that my cheering makes an impact, that my voice changes the outcome. It may not, but I believe it. That's why I cheer. Doug Brooks comes up here to the front of the church. Every now and then you'll hear him just yell, Jesus! So people look at him like, what is wrong with this guy? Okay, I'm backing out the door. You know why? Because he believes that his voice makes an impact. His speech changes something in heaven. He's calling out. Why? Because God did something in his life. God changed his life. God gave him his family back when all hope was lost. So why wouldn't he cheer? You know why he does cheer? Because he has a relationship. We cheer for our team because we're close to our team. We love our team. We follow all the news about our team, our driver, pit crew, everything going on. We know everything about them. Why? Because we're connected to them. That's why we yell, because we're close. But you come into church and somebody yells, we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I'm not one of these guys. I'm about to head out the door. And I've been to some churches that are, I mean, it may be crossing that line just a little bit, but I'm not, I'm not going to be God and judge, but it's, uh, it'll make you feel a little uncomfortable. But guess what? You can't deny the fact that they're praising God because he's changed their life. Amen. I have a hard time some, sometimes holding back. You know, you ever feel that way where you're in service and you just want to yell, but then you're like, man, who's looking at me? And they're going to think I'm a freak. But guess what? Over a year ago, God changed my life. I grew up in church. I was living in darkness. Boom. God said no. He, come, he comes rushing in because I called out to him, and he, and, and he saves me from that situation. I have no other choice but to yell. I have no other choice but to cheer, no other choice but to speak about him, because I believe that my speech has power. I've been driving in the car, and I've had one of those moments, just like Doug, where it's, a song comes on, I'm like, I feel the Holy Spirit in my car, and you may think I'm crazy, and that's okay. I'm crazy. I'm crazy about him. And the only words I can get out are Jesus, and I'm yelling, and I'll tell you what, if somebody were to drive up beside me, they'd probably call the cops or a mental institution or something, because this guy just lost it. I did. I lost it but I got it all. I lost my life, but I gained everything. I lost the life of darkness, and I gained this life of light. The hallucination that I thought was my life, that all I could ever have, when the light comes in, the hallucination disappears. What I thought was the truth is gone because the light is there. If you want to ignite your soul you do it through the act of speech. The words you say have power. You look at this. These guys, you want to talk about people that feel like that their voice makes an impact? Go to a Virginia Tech football game. Best entrance in all of college football. You know what? Those people are yelling, screaming, mad men, mad women. I mean, just watch this. Just watch this.
You know, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Don't be that guy. <laughs> Don't be him. I don't know who he is, but don't be him. We're standing in front of, from the, you know, the creator of the universe. It's okay to jump and to yell and be a crazy fan like me, screaming and yelling, jumping up and down. There's power in that, man. I've been part of, of, of moments like that where everybody's jumping. You can feel it in the atmosphere. If you're that person on the field, you can feel the crowd because their speech don't be him. He may be a nice guy. I don't know. But don't be that. It's okay. I understand it. Maybe out of your comfort zone to maybe yell for one time or to talk about God or, or to sing. But there's power when you do. You want to ignite your soul. You've got to do it through the act of speech. The last act is the last point that I have is actually, oh man, did I lose it again? No, we're going back. Okay. You're like, oh yeah, call them. We're making a reservation. We're on our way <laughs> to lunch. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Time out. All right. So don't be that guy. You see, God inhabits the praises of his people. You want God to move in your life? Praise him. T.D. Jake said, when you worship, there's no way that you can worry. If you're worrying about something, worship God. Your focus on him, a good friend of mine said that he had a moment with God, and he felt like God was, he was, he was so stressed out about all these things in his life, and God told him, he said, let's switch jobs. You worry about me, I'll take care of the rest. When you worship him, he will take care of everything else. Luke 19, 37 through 40. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. You know what Jesus said? He said, If they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. You may look at people that shout in church and say, I just don't believe that's of God. Well, obviously you haven't read Luke. Because didn't say that these people were standing there with their hands in their pocket when Jesus approached. You want to invite Jesus into your life? You want to invite that light into your life? You're going to have to get vocal about it. Sneeze about it. <laughs> Whatever you got to do. Because God inhabits the praises of his people. You want God in your life? Praise him. It's like the Casting Crown song, praise him through the, in the storm doesn't matter the situation. Praise him anyways. It doesn't matter. You may be going through hell. Praise him anyways. You want change? You've got to see it through the act of speech. You must ignite your soul with the act of speech. Now we're going to the final point. The first act of worship needed to, you, to ignite your soul is the act of surrender. You see, I went three points, okay? Does everybody remember what the three points were? No, okay. The act of service and serving others. The act of speech. Now it's the act of surrender. These are points one, two, three, but it's actually steps one, two, three. The first step in igniting your soul is the act of surrender. Job 11, 13 through, or 13 through 18 says, Surrender your heart to God, turn to him in prayer, and give up your sins, even those that you do in secret. Then you won't be ashamed. You will be confident and fearless. 
Your troubles will go away like water beneath a bridge, and your darkest night will be brighter than noon. You will rest safe and secure, filled with hope, and emptied of worry. You cannot do it on your own. Lisa, how long have you been clean? Eight and a half years. years. Addicted to drugs. Doug Brooks, addicted to drugs. There's no meeting. There's no 12-step program that could deliver them, but only through God. They couldn't do it in their own will. It's when they said, you know what? Enough is enough. Here, I surrender. God comes in, rushes to the scene. He rushes in to save those who surrender to him. The act of surrender is symbolized. How? How, What's the action of surrender? The physical action of surrender. Your hands up. You wonder why people raise their hands in church in worship? It's the symbol of I surrender. God, it is not me. They're not trying to get some mystical powers and some, elect, you know, some lightning coming through their fingers. They're saying, look, it's not about me. And I know I'm sweating. It's very hot in here. <laughs> First time ever that I've said it's been hot in church. I always say it's freezing cold. And it may be freezing out there, but it's cold up here. We need to fix that. So, um, but raising your hands is the act of surrender. You see people in church. They raise their hands. Some churches, if you raise your hand, you... They might uh, ask you to, hey, you need to calm down. What they don't realize is it's that heart of, you know what? It's not about me. I give up. I give up my life for you. It's all about you, Jesus. Take it one step further. When somebody's down on their knees and their arms up, that's the symbolism of worship. Some of you may may never been taught the acts of worship. When people shout, it's because they, they're trying, they're changing the atmosphere. They're inviting God into their life. They're speaking over their problems. When they raise their hands and they get on their knees, it's because they're surrendering to God and saying, you know what, it's not about me. It's not about me anymore. It's all about you, Jesus. I can't do this on my own. I personally, I tried doing everything on my own. You know, I had issues, man. They were like, yes, and you still do. But I do, but I'm working on it. You know, I believe, wait, what, how does it go? Somewhere in the future, you're looking much better than you're looking right now, right? And I'm looking better now than I was a year ago. In fact, last year I said, you know what? I'm turning 30. I'm officially going to be old, and, uh, but by 30, I want to be in the best shape of my life. Now, you know, there's, I'm in better shape than I was last year physically, but Spiritually, emotionally, I am in the best shape of my life. Better than ever before. I spoke that over my life a year ago thinking that, you know what, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to start running. I'm running all the time, you know, and do all this kind of stuff. And then it's like I end up working 70 hours a week. And then I'm going to school to finish my bachelor's degree. And, you know, I have a family. And then, you know, I get asked to preach or different things. And I'm like, guess what? Guess what got booted? the running, the working out, because all these other things were priority over that. What I didn't realize is that I was still working out, that I was working on a better me. And I'm thankful and grateful to say that right now I'm in the best shape of my life. The act of surrender is when you lay your burdens, desires, and sins down in exchange for freedom. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come because I'm getting ready to close. And it's, it is early. So, the act of surrender is when you lay your burdens down in exchange for something far greater. I like to think of this as you're in that dark cave, you know? It's freezing cold. It's dark. And you literally have everything you need in front of you to make a fire. You say, no, I really like that stick. I'm going to hang on to it. I don't, well, I don't want to burn up all my fuel. But you're sitting in darkness, freezing. You have to surrender things 
in exchange for something far greater than what you have in your life right now. You cannot do it on your own. Period. And so the worship team is going to play a song. And uh, I'm not asking you to be crazy. I'm not asking you to grab a flag. We don't even have flags. Or, <laughs> or a shofar. We don't have one of those either. Or, take, or you don't know what that is. That's okay. Or take off running. Well, I'm not asking you to, to, to do that. But I'm asking you for once, maybe, maybe the first time ever, to worship God for a moment. If you want victory in your life, you have to surrender the situations to him. You have to. There's no other way around it. You will not find peace, love, or happiness in darkness. Period. It doesn't happen. Those are all gifts from God. And those are illusions that Satan presents. Only God can provide those things. Some of you may be hurting. You may have been hurt. You may be confused. You may have a, a situation in your life that looks like it's completely unavoidable, that the odds are stacked against you. And you're right. You can't make it on your own. You can't. You're not going to find peace, hope, and love outside of the will of God. It doesn't happen. It is a false light that Satan presents to you, leading you astray. And if you don't turn around, you'll be trapped in a cave forever. Your life will flash by you. Your time will pass by. You will look back and say, where did it go? I lost years of my life because of an illusion, because of a lie. I'm Zazu right now. I'm Banana Beak, Mr. Banana Beak to you. And I'm saying, don't do it. Absolutely not. Some of you will walk out of here and you'll do it anyways. And you'll be trapped in that cave waiting for God to rescue you. And he can. But you have to call out to him. You have to surrender your will. You have to change your speech. And you have to change your service, how you serve others. So I want you to stand. And this is an opportunity to put those actions, put those motions into action. I encourage you, if you've never raised your hands, do it one time. I'm not going to judge you. I wouldn't judge you for anything that you're going through. I'm called to love you through your situation. So we're just going to sing this song, and I want you to worship God like you never have before. It's okay to get crazy about Virginia Tech football. It's okay to be crazy at a NASCAR race. It's okay to be crazy at a Celine Dion concert. <laughs> It's not okay to be crazy at a Celine Dion concert. <laughs> but it's okay to be crazy about God. I'm crazy about Him. He changed my life. He gave me everything that I could never get on my own. Every single thing that I have prayed for, God has brought into my life. And He's bringing into my life. Change your speech. Change your service. And surrender. We're just going to sing this song one time through. Thank you. 
It's not about this building. God, it's all about you. It's all about you. It's not our will, but yours be done. God, I know that you're here. I know that you're touching lives. God, you're pulling at hearts right now. 
Lord, I ask that you would open hearts to surrender to you, Jesus. God, I thank you. Now, you may be here and you... You may be under serious attack in your life and you may just now be seeing it for the first time. You may be trapped in darkness and you know the light. Or you could be at a crossroads where you could be at that moment choosing between the two. You know what's right, you know what's wrong, and the choice is yours. I don't care what your circumstance is, God can fix it. There's nothing broke that he can't fix. And so I don't, I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what your struggle is. But I know the solution. I know the healer. And so today, if you're here and you don't know him, or you're in that moment where you, you know him, but you're away from him and you're trapped in darkness, like Simba, and you're, you're, you're ready to, to die, but just call out to his name and he will rescue you. No matter the circumstance, no matter the danger, he rushes to the scene. So right now you're in your chair and this message is spoken to you. I wanna give you the opportunity to meet my father, to meet my savior, the savior of mankind, the one that loves us so much that he gave his only son to die for you. He loves you so much. So right now, if you're at that position, I'm going to count to three and I want you to raise your hand in a sign of submission to the King of Kings. That you're saying that, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to live this life. I'm scared. I'm trapped. You're never too far away for him to come and rescue you. You're never too far gone that he won't leave to find you. And so right now, if you're in that position, if you're away from God, whether you walked away yesterday or you've been away for years, he's here to save you. So I'm going to count to three, and I want you to raise your hands as a sign of submission. If you want to ask Jesus to come into the darkness and light it up, if you want him to ignite your soul, one, two, three. God, I'm asking that you would move in lives, and I thank you for the hands that are raised. God, I thank you for the hands that went up through here. Lord, I know the situations. God, you know the situations. You know the lives that are hurting. And so I want everybody in this building to pray this prayer. You can pray it at your chair, and then we're going to sing this song and praise him again. Dear Heavenly Father, everybody repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've been living in sin. I've been trapped in darkness. And I know that you are the only way. And I ask you to come into my heart and save me. Light up my soul. Light up my world. God, I love you. Lord, we thank you so much. And everybody said, amen. Now we're gonna praise God one more time. You're welcome to leave or you're welcome to praise him. This is a moment. And I thank you so much for coming. Next week, we're gonna be talking about putting on the armor of God. After you light up your soul, you've gotta protect yourself. So next week is all about lighting up your armor. If you want me to pray for you, you wanna to talk to me, you wanna just worship God, the altars are open and I, I invite you to come. Thank you, everybody have a great day.